Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, a warm welcome to you from here, Town Hall Europe, uh, the conference uh, centre of Friends of Europe uh, here in Brussels. Uh, my name is uh, Jamie Shea. I'm a senior fellow uh, here at Friends of Europe, and it's my uh, pleasure uh, once again to be able to serve as the moderator uh, at the opening of our annual Security Summit, uh, the event we put on every year to examine where Europe is going uh, when it comes to peace, security and defence issues. Uh, this year we've uh, chosen the very alluring title of Redefining Defence in an Age of Disruption. Uh, is Europe up to the uh, challenge? Uh, and over the next uh, three days, uh, we'll be attempting to give you a good comprehensive answer uh, to that e essential uh, question. Uh, today, uh, we'll be looking at the strategic picture and in uh, particular, what is European strategic autonomy? Uh, why do we need it? Where uh, is it going to get us? And, and what do we need to do uh, in practical terms in order to be able to put the actions behind the fine words. Um, also today, uh, let me flag for those of you who are really hardcore security fans, and that's all of you of course, that when this session has finished at 3 p.m., we'll be following up immediately with a strategic conversation where uh, the former Secretary General of NATO, Jabda Hubskefa, who is also a trustee of Friends of Europe, uh, will be uh, discussing the way ahead with the SACER, the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, uh, Todd Walters. So please uh, don't go away. Uh, we'll be transitioning immediately to that strategic conversation at uh, 3 p.m. Tomorrow, uh, I'll be back here uh, for the second part of the Security Summit when we'll be looking at the international governance of uh, cyber uh, uh, space uh, and how we can build trust and confidence uh, in the cyber uh, domain with another very distinguished uh, panel. Uh, and then on Wednesday, uh, my colleague here at Friends of Europe, Darmendra Khamenei, will be here to discuss uh, with you all space policy and how Europe can become a space power or a space actor uh, at a time when, of course, space is becoming more important, but also uh, more uh, contested. Uh, so that's the menu uh, for the next uh, uh, three days. Um, let's then uh, go immediately to uh, today and the issue of European strategic autonomy. What does it mean in practice? Uh, what does the European Union need to do differently or better to really be able to exert strategic uh, autonomy? Uh, is this concept essentially a military concept? Uh, for example, the EU running its own operations, uh, doing more to defend its populations or its territories? Or is it something that goes now beyond the military domain to embrace, for example, supply chain autonomy, industrial autonomy, or more technological uh, uh, autonomy. So how elastic a concept uh, is it? Uh, how can the strategic autonomy uh, strengthen not just the European Union, uh, but also the key partnerships on which the uh, EU has depended for many years for its security, the NATO partnership, the transatlantic partnership. For instance, one question is, with uh, President-elect Biden soon to take over the reins in the White House, uh, does Europe still need uh, uh, its strategic autonomy? Or, for example, uh, would a Biden administration offer more opportunities for the Europeans to uh, rea realise it? I think that will be definitely a question on our agenda uh, uh, today. Uh, and then finally, uh, as I know from my NATO days, uh, credibility depends on three things. Capabilities, capabilities, capabilities. As a former NATO Secretary General, Lord Robertson was very fond of saying. So how can Europe put the military punch uh, behind its geopolitical uh, ambitions. So those, I think, are some key questions to guide our debate and to, as I said, provide the insights and the answers. We really have the four best uh, that we could possibly have today. Uh, and so I'm very grateful to our four key speakers for agreeing to participate. Uh, first, we have the Minister of Defence of Lithuania, uh, Raimundus Karablis, uh, joining us from uh, Vilnius. Uh, before becoming a Defence Minister, he was the Vice 
Minister of Foreign uh, Affairs, uh, has a very distinguished diplomatic and political uh, uh, career already behind him. Uh, we have Nathalie Loiseau until not so long ago, uh, the French Minister of European Affairs, but now in the European Parliament as the chair of the Subcommittee on Security and Defence. Uh, we have uh, Elena Gomez de Castro, who is a very well-known face uh, in Brussels because uh, she has spent some of her career here uh, as a diplomat, uh, also working in the European institutions, uh, working at NATO, as well as at the Spanish representation to the European Union. She's now back in Madrid uh, as, the sec as the Director General for defence policy uh, in the Spanish MOD, so we're delighted to uh, see her uh, once more. A and finally, but of course by no means least, uh, Yiri Sedevi, uh, who is the uh, chief executive of the European Defence uh, Agency. And as you can imagine, the questions on capabilities will very much go to him. Uh, Yiri, before becoming uh, the, uh, direct, uh, the chief executive at the EDA uh, was uh, 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 the Czech ambassador to NATO. In the past, he's been both the minister and the deputy minister of defense uh, and a senior NATO official uh, once upon a time as the assistant secretary general for defense planning and policy. So as I've said, you can't really have a better lineup uh, than that. If my four guests today can't throw light on these issues, I doubt that anybody uh, really uh, uh, can. Uh, as always, before I hand over to uh, the Minister uh, to kick us off. Uh, all of you by now have done probably uh, well over a thousand uh, Zooms and WebExes uh, uh, since last March. So you're familiar with the chat, with the raised hand, with the hashtag, which I remind you is uh, Friends of Europe uh, hashtag at uh, Security Summit. Uh, many different ways in which you can come forward with your, dis uh, your points, uh, brief please, and your questions also please, very brief. Uh, as always, please, indicating to whom you wish to put your question, that always uh, helps, and giving your name and affiliation, and we'll try to have as much time for questions as we can possibly uh, fit in. And of course, uh, please, finally, we love to hear from you, but only when I ask you to speak. Uh, so uh, when that is not the case, if you don't mind keeping your mute button on, uh, that will at least help me as the moderator uh, to keep track of uh, what's really going on. So thank you to all of you uh, for uh, following the usual rules of the road in that regard. So first to uh, Minister Karoblis, um, I want to ask him, what does he understand by European strategic autonomy? Uh, what does he think that the EU needs to do in practical terms, you know, beyond the, the declarations and the communiques, uh, to become more self-reliant? And particularly given that he represents Lithuania uh, in the Baltic region, in the eastern part of Europe, where, of course, we all know the NATO and the transatlantic connection is very, very strong. What does he think that European strategic autonomy could do to reinforce the essential transatlantic security and defence uh, relationship? So, Minister, those were my three questions, but we're delighted to have you with us today. And I now give the floor to you for your remarks. Thank you very much and for the word and good afternoon everyone. It's always a pleasure to join the Friends of Europe and it's my favorite organization for some time already. Thank you, Minister. And thank you, thank you really for the opportunity to speak at this, at this year's summit. Uh, well, for almost a year we have battling the COVID crisis and uh, well, by the way, so I am also affected personally. I am in isolation now. I'm speaking not from the, from my office, unfortunately. We are more hopeful with the news of vaccine, but um, it will not solve everything. And Europe uh, still has to take the course for its its future. A lot of is, is at stake, and it will take a lot of concerted efforts for Europe to provide security, protect its values, and retain influence. But how do we achieve that? And uh, what is wiser, doing things on our own way or working together with NATO and our transatlantic allies? I believe that self-reliance would not be the wise choice for the EU. Building its strengths, investing in capabilities and uh, becoming a strong partner in transatlantic security and defense relationship is the right way forward. With the newly elected president of the United States, we will be opening a fresh chapter of transatlantic relations 
we have to show that we are serious about making the chapter meaningful for both sides. Lefina has always supported strong transatlantic relations and has always advocated for more U.S. in Europe, no matter the administration. A strong transatlantic link is indispensable for European security. Lefina says, says it is as, as a neighbor of Russia who shows no signs of changing its aggressive policy. I am very happy about increasing U.S. presence in the Eastern Europe, in particular in the Baltic region, it contributes to the security of the whole European continent. I think that we can agree that in the post-COVID era, a stronger Europe would be beneficial for all, both the Europeans and our allies. So how can you be more prepared to deal with its security needs and to increase our political and security profile? And uh, really here, I think that we need to concentrate on really very concrete issues. What, what's, what are the deliverables? Mm -hmm. Then, of course, uh, having a discussion on, uh, let's say, on some issues as European autonomy. I really would like more the title of the discussions if you add the question mark at the end. I think uh, autonomy, sometimes it's treated quite often as separation from uh, something. We don't think that we should have some kind of separation. We should take more responsibility. And how we should do that? Uh, for that, uh, in my view, we need to focus on three areas. Responsibility, resilience, and readiness. Three R or three R. First on responsibility. EU's ambitions must be backed by real capabilities. You also touched this issue. So we have the responsibility to fund defensive properly. Imagine if James Bond could not afford any of his gadgets. Probably <laughs> he would not be top spy. Would he? This responsibility is about investments into national capabilities. It is the most direct way to enhance the US ability to defend its territory and promote security beyond its borders. We also need to be responsible about EU's own defense initiatives. Take military mobility. It is critical for deterrence and defense in Europe. Without fully fledged military mobility, EU's aspirations to become a strong player will fail. By agreeing to finance military mobility in the next multiannual financial framework, we prove that EU is serious about this project, that 1.5 billion euros is a very minimum of what we need. Resilience. As we emerge from the crisis, it is necessary to enhance our resilience. We need to address vulnerabilities exposed by COVID, especially when it comes to disinformation, cybersecurity, security of supply chains and critical infrastructure. And it is the job where the European Union could, could do really a lot. Third, readiness. Readiness probably not military terms, but more in political terms. COVID has shown that the EU must have readiness to address any kind of threats at any time. Even now, it is not just the pandemic. Conventional and hybrid threats or terrorism are still here. Some issues have become even more prominent. Current situation in Belarus clearly shows that crises just beyond the EU borders can and do still happen. We have to keep focus on the most important security challenges for member states and the new union as a whole. We also need to get a start on future challenges in military technology. To do that, we will have to build sophisticated defense to not fall behind other actors. Cooperation with our partners and allies is part and of, of these endeavors. To achieve more, US defense initiatives must include our strategic partners. The recent compromise on the third party participation in DASCO projects is a good start. This compromise really took time to 
agreed. So finally, we have the agreement with we'll see how it's working. To boost our national collective resilience, it's not enough to do more at home and within the, uh, uh, the Union. We also need cooperation with our allies, for instance, on safe communication networks. Finally, only by working closely with our partners can we achieve the best results in developing modern solutions for defense. In conclusion, to successfully emerge from the present crisis and move beyond it, we must keep focus on our key goals, responsibility, resilience and readiness, a strong cooperation with our allies in an absolute must have in achieving those goals. Without these elements in mind, you cannot have more security at home, no influence globally in the post-COVID world, uh, world, world. And therefore, I asked and I called to concentrate on concrete uh, work, job, on doables instead of continuing the ideological discussions. Thank you. Uh, Minister, thank you very much. And again, thanks very much for joining us today. We wish you a uh, quick uh, and uh, very healthy uh, uh, quarantine uh, up, up, up there. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's we're very pleased that... Uh, that notwithstanding these circumstances, you're able to join us. All the more so as you made very significant remarks, Minister. I like your, your three R's of uh, responsibility, resilience and readiness. The emphasis uh, on the broad concept of strategic autonomy to cover the full spectrum of uh, threats uh, and the balance between work within the EU and engaging vital uh, uh, partners, particularly in the transatlantic uh, area too. Uh, and of course, so the stress on resources and technology as well. And thank you for giving us a not just uh, the headlines, but a roadmap uh, to how we can move uh, forward. Well, listening to you uh, were, of course, the three other speakers, and um, the next is Nathalie Loiseau, uh, I've introduced her already, and uh, as somebody who's been involved in these debates for a long time, both in France and now the European Parliament. Uh, I'd like to ask her, Madame Loiseau, what uh, she thinks the EU can do to achieve more unity, you know, particularly among the 27, the diversity sometimes between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, more unity around a common vision of, of European strategic autonomy uh, and the objectives. Um, I'd like to ask her how this EU role is distinct from what the Europeans are doing, need to do in NATO and the transatlantic relationship. You know, we've got NATO, so why is it essential also to have this other track of security defence efforts? And then coming back to the Minister's uh, focus very much on the practical way ahead, uh, what do we need to do short term, medium term? Term, long term uh, to make all of this uh, 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 happen. And maybe also, Madam Lozo, if you've got time, what do you think the European Parliament can contribute to this exercise? Anyway, too many questions. Now, time for me to stop talking and uh, over to you for all of the answers. Thank you for joining us again today. Uh, hello, Jamie. It's a pleasure to be among friends, friends of Europe. Uh, for a long time, I wanted to be part of your conversation, and thank you for having me today. Well, many questions and only five minutes, so I will try to be brief. Um, I would say that our predecessors uh, had an easier life than the one we're having right now. Uh, for a number of years, things were easy. Uh, NATO was basically taking care of the security of the European territory, with member states, of course, uh, whereas uh, the EU and its member states were dealing with security outside Europe through uh, military missions uh, under the umbrella of the UN or NATO or bilaterally or through CSDP missions. There was a clear distinction. Nowadays, this clear distinction is obsolete. We all know this. Europe is threatened both by non-state actors, and I'm, of course, thinking of terrorist groups, and also by non-military means. We will talk about uh, hybrid threats, and it's not a hypothesis. It's what's taking place be before our own eyes. Cyber attacks have never been that many on public services, on strategic infrastructures, even on electoral processes or uh, political campaigns. Chemical weapons were used on European territory, we all remember the Salisbury incident, uh, which was a signal that had not taken place since World War II. 
disinformation uh, triggered by foreign malicious actors is beating up uh, and we face it on a daily basis everywhere in Europe. This moment in our history, this COVID-19 pandemic reminds us how vulnerable we are and all on all this, NATO is an asset, but NATO is not enough. Europe is also surrounded outside its territory by vulnerable, unstable, fragile neighborhoods. It, if we list our neighborhoods, we'll list a series of crises. Let's talk about Ukraine. Let's talk about Syria and now Lebanon, Libya, uh, Western Balkans and tensions over there. Let's talk about Turkey and its military adventurism, I would say, and down south. Let's think about Sahel. All neighborhoods are unstable, they are fragile, and on this, NATO is either non-interested or non-focused. And mostly for the four last years, because the US was not interested, was not paying attention. And I mentioned Turkey. Turkey being a member of NATO is today part of the problem more than part of the solution. So this is where we are. This is no ideology. These are facts and we have to face them. The world is becoming more dangerous every day. Rogue states are emboldened. What do we do? I think that we need both more NATO and more EU. More NATO, I would not copy my uh, president and talk about brain dead because I don't think, well, it was designed to wake up uh, minds, but I don't think NATO is brain dead. But what I see is that NATO today is paralyzed and we do need to have the strategic conversation about what do we do together? Why do we do it together? And how do we do it together? And of course we need more EU as a relevant European partner and pillar in NATO and also as an autonomous player when NATO is either not able or not willing. And this will happen in, in the coming years. I'm extremely happy to know that Joe Biden is going to be the next president of the United States, but we know that for a, a few days or weeks, our security was depending on the decision and on the vote of a few thousand voters in Pennsylvania. Is it reasonable to be to, to still be that dependent without taking our own responsibilities, as the Lithuanian minister was saying? So what are the challenges for the EU? Uh, and you mentioned unity, Jamie, and rightly so. Now, first, we have to work on a common assessment of threats. This is what we are doing through the exercise of the strategic compass. And I'm rather optimistic because my home country sent military to Lithuania or Estonia in places where for many decades we were not present. Uh, and on the same, at the same time, Lithuania is sending troops down south in an area where there was little interest for quite a while. So things are moving. Uh, but we also have to get rid of this rule of unanimity for decisions taken uh, as regards defense and foreign policy. Because what does it mean unanimity? It means that if we are not fully united the 27, the decisions will be drafted, crafted by the less enthusiastic of us all. And this is not possible. This is a recipe for inaction. We also need to put our money where our mouth is. That is to say, as you said rightly so, Jamie, capabilities, capabilities, capabilities. Not to have redundancies. Even if we all know if we work on security and especially on cyber security, that redundancies is sometimes a way to protect ourselves better. But we need this European Defense Fund, which will take place uh, beginning of next year in order to be uh, able to boost our research and development on military equipment. But we also know, need to go to be more serious on our operational commitments through PESCO, but also when we decide military missions and operations. Let's have member states really sending, sending staff 
sending troops, sending equipments, not just being nice and, and playing nice in, in uh, Foreign Affairs Council meetings and press conferences. When you say something, you do it. And we do need to invent a new relationship with the UK because of course a strategic partner left us is resisting uh, the idea of having a defense relationship with the EU. Uh, I think it's unfortunate, but we should not let it there. And we should try to reinvent a strong relationship with our British friends, because as we said in France, when we signed with the UK, the uh, Lancaster House Treaty, there is no single vital interest from the UK, which is not a vital interest for France or more broadly for the European Union. So I'm neither optimistic nor pessimistic. Yep. I think that we definitely need a strong Europe as a strong ally of the United States, just because the free world right now has stopped its, its expansion and it's facing a pushback. So we have to stand yep. strong together and defend common values and common interests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Natalie, if I may, Madam Rosal. Uh, you gave us a very programmatic uh, action plan there, uh, and uh, I'm glad that uh, you uh, gave some good uh, sort of explanations of what the EU can do in terms of the neighbourhood, in terms of dealing with some of the hybrid activity, uh, where NATO perhaps is less able, less suited. We could debate, of course, uh, that, but you made a good case. Uh, but also uh, you suggested some avenues in, in terms of uh, uh, how we could take it forward. The strategic compass, the unanimity rule, the resources, like the minister, uh, that's uh, vital. Uh, but also the importance of solidarity. I remember that Manuel Valls, a former French Prime Minister once was asked, what about the European army? And he said, the European army, c'est la France, at a time when France was very much on its own in Sahel, of course. So I think your call for solidarity in terms of sharing the, the burdens on operations is uh, going to be uh, well heeded. So thank you very much for that. Now we move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Elena uh, Gomez de Castro. Uh, I know uh, Elena wants very much to address the notion of uh, how military forces, uh, particularly in COVID and other shocks, uh, can help uh, with uh, building uh, resilience and some of the lessons learned there. Uh, and also uh, how uh, the European strategic autonomy could contribute to a better quality of multilateralism around the world. The need to connect it to key partners is something that's already been raised. So Elena, good to see you there in Madrid. Uh, great to see you again. Uh, even only on a screen in a Brussels uh, circle. And now over to you. Good morning, Jamie, and thank you very much for inviting me to be here today with all of you. The 21st century has shown us that most of the problems we are confronted to are not military in essence, but also that defence is part of the solution to any of our problems. COVID-19 has changed the world and has become a comprehensive destabilizing factor, the consequences of which are still to be assessed. The pandemic has triggered national responses and many governments have put their armed forces at the service of their citizens. Their preparedness, responsiveness and capabilities have been key to support the overstretched civilian capacities. It is important to underline that these efforts have been undertaken while maintaining the ability to fulfill their responsibilities, both at home and in all those countries where we are deployed, either in a crisis management context or within the NATO's collective defence system. And it is also worth noting that despite the dramatic consequences, the international community has also shown solidarity. So let me also thank EU and NATO for the support that they have brought to our citizens for helping us be more resilient together and for starting a work that I am sure will continue in the next decade. So three main ideas to start. First, the armed forces at the service of the citizens. We have demonstrated once again the utility of the armed forces of defence in times of crisis. Second, while preserving our defence, national defence, collective defence and international crisis management responsibilities. And finally, multilateralism as an essential asset to confront risks and challenges. And what we have learned here and how we have worked in Spain, I think 
underscores very well how we can do it also better at the EU and NATO level. For instance, it's not only that the capabilities are essential. Of course, CBRNM capabilities uh, were paramount, but not only. Strategic airlift like the A400 have revealed to be essential in terms of getting all the equipment we needed at the time. Uh, working with the academia, for instance, the laboratories, CBRN, have been working with epidemiologists to make sure that we could be uh, more reliable in what we were doing. Also working with industry, for instance, adapting an artificial snow cannon to do large disinfections for large surfaces, or adapting a counter ID robot uh, to include uh, ultraviolet uh, rays to disinfect uh, large surfaces where sensitive material was accumulated. And of course, field hospitals and the military pharmacy and medicine have been essential. And that is why we must make sure that we can continue working together, drawing lessons together of what we have all have done to make sure that it won't happen again in the future. Multilateralism is essential. First, organizing the support needed. If we speak about NATO, of course, the Euro Atlantic Disaster Response Coordination Center has been an important tool for Spain. And here I would like to thank, when we speak about the visions, well, we say in Spain that it's deeds that show love and not mere words. Well, the Baltic countries and Poland, the Czech Republic and others have sent us very critical equipment in times of crisis. As for the European Union, for instance, the repatriation of all the stranded citizens abroad has been essential to provide that stability also in our societies. Second, preserving our democracies. There is a shared responsibility here now that we have started working from home using computers, cybersecurity and disinformation are paramount to make sure that we can preserve our values of democracy in the future. And here, the effort has been shared by the citizens, by the state, but also by EU and NATO that have been making sure that all those disinformation campaigns were responded in a timely manner. Third, preserving international peace and stability. Of course, the collective defense systems have worked very well and they have not uh, suffered any consequences of the COVID pandemic, regardless of the impact it may have had at a national level, like for instance here in Spain. Second, crisis management operations and missions are essential as COVID is a comprehensive destabilizing factor and we have made sure that that could go on. I think for the future we must develop, and this is the last point, together what we need at the operational level with the uh, PESCO projects like, for instance, the Medical Command uh, led by Germany, but also others. We will now soon propose a common protocol for deployment and redeployment of our troops abroad that can be common both for, United, for the EU and for NATO. Uh, military health is another dimension where we should work more together and finally industry. Of course, uh, Ambassador Sedivi will speak afterwards, so I'm sure he can dwell on how we can work together through PESCO and through the cards, also in that dimension. We need to prepare better for the future. Yesterday I was reading an article that said the future catastrophes are nightmares from which we can still wake up. Only working together will we be able to do it. Thank you very much. Elena, thank you very much. I'm very grateful to you for giving us some of your sort of practical experience in Spain from using your military and your military technologies in a very imaginative and very flexible way. Cannon that can be used to disinfect. Uh, probably nobody thought of that when they designed the cannon, but I think it does show that you know we can sort of use technology in multiple ways and uh, to help the civilian authority as well. And uh, that form of imagination and innovation is also part of uh, strategic autonomy. But you also made important remarks about the way in which we can build resilience by offering actions rather than words and assistance to each other uh, and finally of course the notion that digital security as we move into this digital age it is going to be absolutely vital not just to uh, allow things to function but to protect our democratic values as well so again thank you for introducing new ideas uh, into an already uh, rich debate you also mentioned uh, Yuri at the very end so you uh, segued into him very nicely uh, 
So, Yuri, what I'd like to ask you, uh, having listened to all of this, is what does strategic autonomy therefore mean in terms of those capabilities? What does Europe have already? Uh, Elena suggested also imaginative ways of using it. Uh, but what do we need to acquire uh, and how can we acquire it, particularly in these uh, financially difficult times with the economic impact of COVID uh, likely to be enormous, maybe for a generation to uh, uh, come? Uh, and your own agency, the EDA, European Defence Agency, is playing a big role uh, in this. But tell us what exactly that role is. So, Yuri, great to see you uh, from just across town here today. Uh, very interesting backdrop with obviously some of those capabilities already there. And over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Xavier. And good, good afternoon from, from EDA to you, you all. And uh, first of all, I will start uh, from the outset and very, in a very straightforward way that I believe that especially in times that are coming or perhaps we are entering them already in them, times of uh, fiscal pressures when uh, defense budgets uh, might be um, uh, actually um, uh, challenged, uh, the, 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 the rational option, the rational answer is uh, that uh, we should work more together. Uh, we should increase our uh, cooperation uh, and indeed above all in the area of military capabilities and related to that indeed uh, industrial cooperation, technologies, etc. I believe that actually this is the way for Europe especially uh, in order also to uh, support uh, strategic, uh, strategic autonomy. And uh, if you ask me about uh, more concretely about uh, what kind of uh, capabilities uh, I believe that, first of all, strategic autonomy is uh, about putting uh, member states, EU member states, in a position where we can uh, uh, autonomously develop, operate, modify, and maintain the full spectrum of high-end defense capabilities we need. And this notion of full spectrum, high-end, actually, we can find as an ambition formulated already in the 2016 uh, global uh, strategy of the European Union. So it's about giving uh, EU member states the option and ability, technological, industrial, operational, and political in the end, and this is interrelated, to be able to take action whenever needed uh, to, to protect uh, our values, to protect our, 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 our citizens, and indeed uh, to defend our interests, either together or with partners, notably NATO, wherever possible, or separately if required. So uh, for me, uh, strategic autonomy uh, stands on, on, on four uh, legs or pillars, means autonomy in the area of uh, technologies, technological autonomy or higher technological autonomy, industrial autonomy, operational autonomy, and indeed political decision-making autonomy. Now, uh, 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 the full spectrum, uh, indeed, uh, this is something that uh, for the European Union uh, uh, is a long way to achieve. At the same time, we have a, a number of instruments now, uh, such as permanent structured cooperation, uh, such as coordinated a new review on defense just approved by defense ministers on Friday. We will have European Defense uh, uh, Fund and uh, in, throughout all these instruments, uh, we have uh, uh, defined a set of uh, priorities for capability development uh, in the short, mid and long term. And those, if uh, realized altogether, within let's say 10, 15 years, we will see strategic change. We will see strategic impact. Uh, these are again changing. But the, the, indeed, the precondition, fundamental precondition is that the member states not only realize this on paper, but will start implementing uh, these uh, priorities in, in uh, reality. All those priorities defined, and the definition started in the capability development plan uh, two or three years ago, all those priorities are, are very carefully uh, sort of a, uh, uh, calculated or, or, or uh, weights or, or calibrated so that to complement or not to duplicate uh, those capabilities that are being developed uh, in NATO. Now, a bit more concretely, what, what, we, what we are missing, and, and, and above all, we are missing in Europe, in European Union, 
for that autonomy, he enables such as, uh, for example, uh, strategic uh, transport, strategic transportation, uh, especially in the air, military mobility across Europe. Then another enabling or supporting capacities needed for uh, uh, autonomous command and control to start with planning capacity and indeed then conduct commanding capacity supported by uh, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance. And, uh, uh, and then perhaps I would highlight the third area, which I really believe is a critical shortfall and is the area of air and missile defense. At the same time, if you look at, if we look at those priorities uh, defined within the PESCO, European Defense Fund, or the coordinated annual review on defense, all these areas are well addressed there. So we have a uh, project uh, ready for that. We have more and more member states actually uh, showing their hands up uh, and saying we are going to lead in this or that area, be it the Netherlands in the military mobility, France in the air and missile defense, a big project in PESCO called Twister, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or uh, other uh, member states actually in the area of maritime uh, capacity. So I believe uh, to, uh, to, to finish, uh, now, I believe that we have now, we know what we know, what we want. We have our priorities well defined. Those priorities are uh, mid long and uh, mid to long term priorities, well defined, realized altogether, implemented altogether. We can see strategic change. So now it starts. It, it's, the, it's 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 the time to start uh, thinking how to implement them by first considering uh, those priorities in uh, our national uh, defense planning uh, processes so that we can deliver a real change towards true strategic autonomy and credibility of European Union as strategic and autonomous, and uh, I would say also uh, contributing um, uh, security, global security actor uh, uh, within the, let's say, next five to 15 years. Yuri, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for that very upbeat, but also detailed uh, uh, presentation. As Yuri knows, uh, like all of us, one of the criticisms of the European security and defense effort, particularly in American circles and elsewhere, has been it was strong on ambition and vision, but not always with the, the capabilities to, to back it up. As they say in Texas, you know, big hat but few cattle. Uh, but what Yuri says suggests that that gap is now being closed and over 10 or 15 years can be closed completely. That's an enormously encouraging uh, forecast. And what also I found encouraging was not just a clear sense of the priorities, but the fact, as Yuri said, that nations uh, have stepped up to lead PESCO and other projects in the various areas to de deliver them indeed. So uh, 10, 15 years may seem like a long wait, but in military terms, it's not much. So uh, watch this space. Yuri, thank you so much for that. Uh, let's go to the questions. Uh, I recognise first of all uh, my uh, colleague, a senior fellow at Friends of Europe, Paul Taylor, uh, who should be uh, in, in some very pleasant location in the south of France. Uh, I see he is. So Paul, over to you. I can't deny that, Jamie. Uh, uh, thanks to the speakers for your introductory remarks. Uh, Madame Loiseau in particular, you, you identified uh, uh, the, the unanimity rule as a, as a key break on the efficiency of European foreign and security and defense policy. And I think that many uh, countries feel that. We've heard it all similar views from Germany and so on. But it, it raises the question of ownership, as we know. And so I have to ask you, um, having been in government in France, would France be prepared to be outvoted um, in uh, the Council of Ministers uh, on an issue that was important to it, let's say uh, Libya, for example, where you haven't always been in the majority, or perhaps on sanctions on Russia. And don't you fear that uh, if you go switch to majority voting, you'll have a situation where member states don't feel that they actually have ownership uh, of the policy uh, individually, and that you might get end up with decisions like the decision that was taken on uh, quotas of... Uh, uh, relocation quotas for refugees that actually can't be implemented because some member states simply won't be allow themselves to be overruled. Thank you. Okay, Paul, thanks very much. Uh, your, the question was uh, obviously very clearly 
uh, aimed uh, at uh, Natalie Loiseau, so I'll turn to her to provide an answer. If any of the other three panellists uh, also want to come in on the back of this question, please uh, somebody speak uh, uh, immediately after Natalie has finished answering. So, yeah, I think it would be interesting to know if the Lithuanian minister also would be willing to be overruled if uh, on the Spanish... <laughs> Well, we'll, we'll let him answer. But first of all, to uh, Natalie Loiseau, please. Well, thank you, Paul, for this question. And I saw a number of other questions on the same topic in the chat. So I'll try to, to, to answer all of them. Um, first, let's state what's taking place right now with the unanimity rule that we are implementing. Are we happy with it? Is it efficient? Is it working? Uh, is it satisfactory? Well, we have so many examples in which uh, we were late, good decisions were delayed because one member state, uh, for reasons which were very often not related to a foreign affairs, security and defense issue, decided to veto uh, a, a well-needed decision. Uh, you remember, Irini, it took quite a while before we could launch the uh, operation because some member states were reluctant uh, and willing to make sure that would, there would be no search and rescue activities for Irini, even if it's just the, 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 the law of the sea, that if you see people drowning, you go uh, and you, you help them. Uh, on other issues, you remember when Cyprus, for obviously good reasons, were willing to have uh, European measures towards Turkey, was blocking sanctions on Lukashenko and Belarus two things that were not linked, but could be linked because of this rule of unanimity. And I could go on like that forever. Uh, very often, uh, the EU was disappointing towards its fellow citizens uh, and showing an ability to act because of this unanimity rule. Well, if you decide that you abandon it, of course you have to be ready not to rule the show every day of the year. And if I'm saying it, having been in the French government, that might be interesting to some of your ears, uh, because uh, you might have thought that it was more difficult for us than for others. Uh, well, I've been a European Affairs Minister, and there are so many domain sectors on which qualified majority voting uh, is implemented. Of course, you don't always get what you wanted in the first place, but you struggle to convince, to listen, to find compromises, uh, to get a good solution that can be accepted by a majority. And then you implement it uh, when it's taken. And I definitely think that if we want to be a relevant uh, actor in, on the global stage, we cannot continue like we have in the, in the past. You mentioned um, Russian sanctions. Uh, let me be clear, uh, I'm not uh, uh, putting in the open uh, a secret that was unknown to others. It was neither, never France who wanted to change uh, Russian sanctions. We have always said, uh, my, my home country, that as long as Russia was not making progress uh, on uh, Ukraine and Crimea, uh, sanctions were to remain. It was other member states. So yes, I'm super comfortable telling you that uh, sanctions on Russia, uh, the decisions, uh, we were only always on the side of the majority. Libya, we have only always been supportive of the Berlin process and we are struggling to have everyone on board. Then there is another question. And, and Natalie, it was you will excuse me for barging in here, but we've got lots of people still want to ask questions. So with every okay. respect, and your answer is excellent, but with every respect, could I ask you to conclude it just a sentence? Because then I can bring you in again and other people as well, uh, because we only have less than 15 minutes left now. Please excuse me, but I'm, the, uh, I'm under the dictatorship of the clock. So a very short comment on ownership. I wish that with unanimity, every member state would feel ownership, would send troops, would send equipment, and would send staff. It is unfortunately not the case. It's a question of political will, and it's a question of common assessment of threats, and this is what we are working on. 
Thanks, for, thanks very much. Uh, anybody else quickly want to come in on that? Uh, no no uh, obligation. Paul mentioned uh, Minister Karablis, but uh, I'm not putting him on the spot if he doesn't want to be put on the spot. Yes, I see. Please. Please, sir. Uh, your mute button, please, Minister. Yeah. Excellent. Now? Yes, please. Yes. Good. The issue of ownership is, is really important here. Uh, and uh, in particular, so the unanimity in such issues as, as, as foreign policy and, and defense is uh, very important for the, for the smaller countries which, has, which have key security and in, 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 in interests. Well, for example, I was in a situation in Corridor uh, some, uh, some time ago, eight years ago, when uh, the plan regarding visa-free regime with Russia was on the table, and uh, well, several countries we needed just not agree with with, uh, with 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 that, and not joining, not meeting the consensus. It's one of the examples. Sometimes we need, but of course, on the other hand, they agree that, that we need to maybe look to the issues. Maybe we need some specification, categorization of issues, which could be also uh, well, the decisions could be adopted by 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 the, the the qualified majority but i think that's more even the discussions on foreign policy than defense policy which is more sensitive issue it's about national capabilities and also well we are making decisions in nato by unanimity including on capabilities so i think this this is up it, it's more so discussions but the issue of, of on, on foreign policy that in particular but it's uh, the issue of anonymity is, is here of course uh, minister thanks very much indeed let's go next to uh, elena lazaru elena thanks for waiting patiently so please uh, come into the debate uh, yes, hi. Thank you very much, Jamie, for asking me to come in. However, my, my question was already a, um, answered by Mrs. Loiseau because I was just basically complimenting the question by Paul Taylor. It was on QMV. Okay, you could have uh, selfishly used this opportunity to have another question, but if you don't want <laughs> to do that, Elena, uh, I'll then go to uh, Brooks uh, Tigner. And as I always say, no Friends of Europe session would ever be complete unless Brooks asked a question. So, Brooks, uh, uh, no exception this time either. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jamie. Can you hear me? Yes. Fine. I have a question for Minister Karoblis, although if the others want to come in on it, that's fine. Um, regarding the cuts to the military mobility and the European Defense Fund. Indeed, it is difficult to see how the outside world will take the EU's defense ambitions seriously, given that uh, military mobility was cut by 75% and the Euro Defense Fund by more than half. So my question to you, Minister, uh, a simplistic one first, uh, do you think these cuts send a positive or a negative signal to Europe's adversaries? I hope you'll give us an honest assessment there. But more importantly, what do you think will be the consequences of those severe budget cuts to military mobility and the European Defence Fund? Thank okay, you. Okay, Brooks, thanks very much. So, Minister, over to you, please. On the, with the mute button. Yes, indeed, thank you for the question. And indeed, uh, so, uh, we are not happy by this uh, cuts. Uh, so uh, from the initial positions which were presented by the European Commission. Uh, but uh, of course, I would like to remind that in one uh, stage of negotiations, it was even zero. So at least yeah. one, one and a half uh, billion is, is, is uh, the, the line from which we, the, the ground where we could start. And uh, really, I just would like to remind that we don't have such a mechanism. The regulations also should be adopted by that. And we need to try, we need to, 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 to launch it. Uh, so, and uh, really, the practice shows when the European Union launches the new financial mechanisms, for example, on SEP, at the beginning stage, the, in its implementation is, is, is quite uh, weak and vulnerable. But yes, it is the issue, and uh, frankly, so for four of us, for Lithuania, the military mobility is the litmus test whether the European Union could have the real, uh, could be really strong on security and defense policy. This is without any doubts, but on military mobility, let's start implementing that. 
Thank you uh, very much indeed. Thank you, Minister. Now I go to dear old friend and uh, colleague, the former ambassador of Greece uh, to, to NATO and Assistant Secretary General, Terry Stamatopoulos. So, Terry, please, good to see you. Question is now for you to ask. Uh, Jamie, my question was also related to uh, QMB. Uh, uh, but before I get there, let me just say that we're talking about strategic autonomy, and, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that we fully grasp uh, uh, either term, I mean, what strategic is and what autonomy is, you know, uh, exactly. I would agree with uh, Madame Loiseau that uh, uh, it comes down to political will uh, and, and, and the rest uh, would follow, but uh, political will has been found lacking. On, on QMV, and I don't want to elaborate on this too much because it's a narrower topic to this broader and very interesting conversation, I was just uh, pointing out that we are going from 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 sovereignty issues that necessitated unanimity to QNV, which intro would introduce a, a weighted inequality between the states. So decisions would be take it, taken if we go to qualified majority voting, uh, if I understand it correctly, according uh, to to uh, the, the the weight given to each country and not each country having an equal weight, even uh, so, so it would be different from, let's say, a 27 minus one, uh, but, but it would, uh, in fact, uh, introduce a, a new element of inequality in decision making that I think we need to uh, think about very, very carefully. Terry, Terry, do you have a, a, qu a question? That was an interesting no, comment. No, 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 okay. was, Thank you for also clarifying that, that, that issue. Yes, it's always more complicated than it looks on the surface. A uh, few minutes left. Uh, so, uh, Stephanie Weiss, uh, uh, I know, Stephanie, you've also been waiting patiently. So, let's bring you in now with your question, please. Thanks a lot. I um. I was just wondering, because following the scene, you know, we talk about um, these capabilities and what we would need to, to approach uh, something like strategic autonomy now for 20 years, and we, at least for 20 years. And I, and it's, it's very repetitive, you know, every five years, uh, we were discussing that we lack um, <coughs> in enabling capabilities, but I can't see you how this will change and where, why we are now again so optimistic that even if everyone is talking about that we have to take um, on more responsibility, um, that that could change. Um, Stephanie, so that forgive me for butting in again. Uh, good point, but is, the, is that a comment or do you also want to put that in the form of... Yeah, a, I would a like to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to get to know from, from the panel um, uh, if they are optimistic <laughs> on... I mean, they, they were telling us what, what is needed, yeah. um, but uh, I would like uh, to get to know what, what their judgment right. is. Right, so are you are we optimistic on that score? Fine, so I'll take that. Uh, we've, we've heard already from Madame Rosso and from the minister, so to be fair also to Elena and to Hiri, I will ask Elena if she is feeling particularly optimistic uh, in general when it comes to all of those capabilities. Hiri gave a very uh, up, upbeat uh, uh, presentation, but backed it up with uh, lots of concrete initiatives. Uh, that mobility, military mobility question came up in terms of funding, uh, and it was answered. But you also mentioned the Netherlands sponsoring a military mobility program. So despite the constrained financial envelope, do you nonetheless, at, in the EDA, feel that's moving ahead? So, uh, Elena, if you'd like to you know, tell us about your degree of optimism when you survey the scene. And Yuri, if you'd like to say something about how military mobility is actually happening on the ground in practice, because on the ground, of course, is the, uh, the key area for it, right? Uh, over to you two, please. Thank you very much. Well, first, if we speak about uh, multinational um, initiatives in Europe, I think the A400M, NH90, so Rotary Wing, um, the Eurofighter, uh, I think have shown that we are able and willing to do things in Europe. Now that we have uh, PESCO and we have the European Defence Fund, what we are seeing in those PESCO projects is that perhaps there's a way ahead that might be a bit different from the past. So the exception may become the rule in domains such uh, as important, for instance, as uh, the maritime dimension with, for the first time, a corvette that might be constructed among different European countries. So, of course, um, we have to deliver. Of course, it's too early to judge, 
but I, I think there's the impetus, there's the boost, I think there's the will, and I do hope that we will be able to deliver in five, six years. Thank you. So I think, Stephanie, the mood of the, the team here is that we're not underplaying the challenges, but it looks like it's better on track now than maybe uh, just a, a, a few years ago. But anyway, uh, Yuri, uh, you, you uh, have perhaps also some comments to make on how you see uh, the delivery side of things happening, and uh, I mentioned military mobility. So we're going to let you have at least the, uh, the final word for today. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's great responsibility. First of all, I, I would say this is not about optimism or pessimism. This is about uh, the time in which we are, and uh, the time actually is uh, very specific. We have a deteriorating strategic environment. COVID does not stop, uh, has not stopped uh, uh, geopolitical competition, even sharpen it. So that's one imperative, actually, the world around us. Second imperative, U.S. will be, whatever administration, more and more involved uh, in Asia Pacific. We need really uh, to have our autonomous instruments to take care of our neighborhood at, 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 at least. And third imperative, we have now tools that we have had not uh, had before. Now, you asked me about uh, military mobility. Indeed, it would be good to have there the initial, uh, the initial estimate. Now we have uh, just a fragment of that, 1.5 1, 1. Uh, billion euro over seven years. At the same time, it's not uh, only about, uh, let's say, physical infrastructure. It's not only about material uh, capacities, military mobility. There are a lot of uh, still um, obstacles uh, 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 in uh, terms of uh, administrative, administ administrative procedures. And European Defense Agency, is working very concretely now very closely with NATO, for example, on simplifying substantively uh, the uh, 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 custom procedures um, uh, that could really uh, save uh, days. But in the long term, indeed, uh, I believe that uh, one of the focus areas in the coordinated uh, annual uh, review on defense recommended for implementation is called enhanced military mobility which includes not only ground uh, land military mobility, but also maritime and air military mobility. And again, indeed, uh, this, I believe, is one of the fundamental precondition for uh, making uh, Europe uh, more secure and better uh, defensible into the future. So let's use what we have indeed as much as possible, as efficiently as much as possible. At the same time, let's look beyond just uh, the uh, uh, framework of the uh, uh, of the uh, multi-annual uh, financial um, uh, framework, and, and let's try actually to harness this uh, challenge yep. also within other uh, uh, programs and projects uh, uh, within uh, PESCO, EDF, and elsewhere. Thank you, Yuri. Thank, thanks uh, very much uh, for, for that. Uh, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of our one hour. It went very, very quickly, but I think it threw uh, a great deal of uh, light uh, onto the topic. My takeaways are that uh, the European strategic autonomy is driven by the notion of self-reliance. Uh, Natalie Loiseau pointed out that sometimes things uh, can hang a very thin thread by a few thousand votes in Pennsylvania. It worked out well this time, hopefully, for Europe, but uh, who knows for the future. Um, secondly, we've had some good rationales for why European uh, EU strategic autonomy makes sense and uh, does things that maybe some of the other institutions can't do or not so well. We've discovered that European strategic autonomy can build resilience on the home front as well as help to solve crises abroad. But it all depends at the end of the day on solidarity. Uh, allies can be assisted, but in return, they are expected to assist uh, others as, as, as well. Finally, uh, when I heard Natalie Loiseau speak about the majority voting issue, I was re reminded of a line from the Rolling Stones, which said, you can't always get what you want, but you can try some time and you might just find you get what you need. 
Uh, and I think Europe at least now is getting more of what it needs. Uh, good conclusion, at least from my side. And I thank most warmly on behalf of Friends of Europe, uh, our four uh, uh, speakers. All of them were wonderful, as I expected they would be. Uh, if they were here physically in Town Hall Europe, we could give them a hearty round of applause. Uh, but uh, if there's such a thing as a virtual round of applause, please give it because they have richly earned it uh, today. Also, before I uh, hand over to uh, Yabda Hubskeva uh, for the view from the US and his conversation with the Saka, just don't forget, please, that tomorrow we uh, begin again uh, at uh, two, where we will have an idea sharing session led by the Nobel laureate Jody Williams on artificial intelligence and autonomous weapon systems. And then we'll be talking, as I said, with another very good panel uh, on building trust in cyberspace. And Wednesday, of course, don't forget, we continue with space. So that's all from me for now. Uh, yep, I hope you are there uh, and uh, you are ready as you always are to take over. Uh, you are. It's great to see you. Always looking fit and well. Uh, and now I, I, I pass the, the floor to you for your conversation with uh, Saka. Thank you, and bye from me for now. Thank you so much, uh, Jamie, uh, and thank you, General Walters, uh, Sakyo, to uh, have found the time to enter into, uh, into our conversation. A warm welcome uh, to you, General. Uh, the General and I have uh, had a pre-conversation. Uh, we have half an hour for our conversation, and uh, we both uh, will take uh, three or four minutes uh, to kick off uh, this theme uh, and this half hour. And given the fact that I ended my military service as just a second lieutenant, I have the great respect for four-star generals, certainly U.S. generals, uh, and we have decided that the General Waters would, uh, would kick off, and then uh, we'll see uh, where the discussion flow will, uh, will lead us. But General Waters, great pleasure. Up, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. It is really good to hear your voice and see your face. And also for the last several minutes to see Jamie Shea, uh, his voice, and, and look at how wonderful he looks. It, it feels like a good old fashioned NATO headquarters meeting up at Brussels. So my, my, my first of all uh, opening is th thanks so much for the opportunity to spend some time with you. I, I would like to comment on, on two major accomplishments in the near term with respect to NATO. And, and, and the first is North Macedonia at 30. And as we all know, to bring one more nation in who shares our incredible value system uh, dramatically increases NATO's solidarity. And that has certainly been the case with North Macedonia. Uh, I'm also pleased to report, Mr. Secretary, we've, we've made some palpable gains with respect to NATO command structure adaptation. Uh, we're on the cusp of getting Joint Forces Command Norfolk located on the east coast of the United States up to full operational capability. And we're very, very close to Joint Support Enabling Command to do the same. And both of those will increase our ability to extend freedom all the way across the Atlantic. And when we have to generate more peace on the European continent with a great logistics command like Joint Support Enabling Command, we will dramatically improve our posture in that arena. I'm excited about what's taking place and I'm really excited about the future. And I look forward to sharing some of those thoughts with you, Mr. Secretary, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, General, for this, uh, for this introduction. Uh, le let me add, uh, uh, trying to take a political, uh, political angle uh, that I think uh, when we discuss uh, security uh, more in general, uh, and I'm looking at the same time at the incoming U.S. administration, I think the biggest challenge for not only for the U.S., but for all of us, and that includes, of course, the European Union and, and NATO, uh, will be balancing China. Uh, balancing China uh, will lead uh, to uh, questions uh, about the partnerships uh, the United States has entered into, questions about NATO. Let me give you an example, and I know that the Secretary General Stoltenberg is working on it. Does, does NATO have a China policy? Uh, uh, the discussions have started in, in, in NATO. Uh, but to make it more concrete, is freedom of navigation in the South and East China Seas, uh, is that an exclusive United States responsibility? Uh, or would it be a more responsibility of the West? And then I define the West broader than us uh, here in, in Europe or NATO and the European Union. I think about uh, partners in the West as well, like Australia, Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, potentially India, and, 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 and so on and so forth. 
those questions will also be focused on burden sharing, uh, uh, general burden sharing in the in the in the financial uh, sense of the word. Uh, we are not doing well in Europe. Uh, we are doing uh, deplorably bad. Yeah, the percentages go up now because GDP is going down as a consequence of COVID. Uh, so in financial burden sharing, there is still uh, an awful lot to do, uh, although more money has been has been coming in. Uh, but the, the example I gave on, on NATO and the South and East China Seas, uh, it, it's also political burden sharing. And, and that's relevant for the European Union as well, uh, where uh, the, the question will come from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, what, what is your weight in our partnership? We're all for partnership. What is your weight, European friends? Do you have a China policy uh, which goes beyond uh, exporting cars uh, in, a, in a slight exaggeration? So in, in, in brief, there are a, lo a lot of questions which will come from the other side of the ocean to us, questions we have uh, for, the, uh, for the Americans, uh, questions for NATO and questions for the European Union. General, over to you. Thanks, Mr. Secretary. It, 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 as you well know, there, there is value in autonomy. It forces large organizations to take full accountability for their actions. And, and as you well know, when we take a look at some of the large organizations that have the ability to contribute to generating peace inside of Europe and outside of Europe, one, one can quickly look in all domains to include whole of government, whole of nation at the EU and at NATO. And, and as a military member, and as you practice as a secretary general, one of the things that we absolutely positively must do is, is make the most productive use on the investments whether the investments are small or large. And I will say we have had six straight years of, of increased percentage of investments by our NATO allies. And it has, uh, it has graduated into well over uh, 100 million, 100 billion non-US dollars since 2016. And as a military member, uh, I'm able to look at the environment and find ways to increase our strategic alignment and transparency. So when we look at, for example, all of the activities of the EU and all the activities of NATO, you would wanna make sure that through the military dimension and outside of the military dimension, we have the best strategic and alignment and transparency possible. And one of the things that we've been able to produce in, in the NATO military domain is a strategy, the first we've seen in over six and a half decades, a NATO military strategy, and subsequently a concept for the deterrence and defense of the Euro-Atlantic area, and soon to be a SACIR AOR-wide strategic plan that references what we do in the military domain. And at the end of the day, these plans will allow nations to craft their national military plans to be more focused on what it is they can and can't do to enhance that strategic transparency and alignment. And we've actually been without that clear direction and guidance for several decades. And this puts us in a step to where ultimately nations can look at requirements in the military domain and be more suited to, to adjust to the environment to help deliver peace on the European continent than we have in the past. And as long as we continue to work very, very hard at the Secretary General level, which as you well know, Secretary General Stoltenberg does, that strategic transparency and alignment that exists between EU and NATO can be very, very palpable and, and really assist us in generating more peace. And, and we are doing that. And when it's all said and done, it makes NATO at 30 far greater of an alliance with far greater trust and far greater ability to keep folks who continue to demonstrate malign influence, for example, China, outside of European borders, as well as inside of European borders at bay. And I think that serves a great purpose to ultimately generate more peace from a global perspective, as well as a regional perspective. Let, let me, General, thank you. Let, let, me, let me pick up the point, uh, uh, the points you made also on, 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 on Europe, uh, strategic autonomy. I must say, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the word uh, uh, be, because when, when you launch such a slogan, uh, you should be very serious to achieve it. Uh, and I also know from, from American friends that in, in the United States of America, 
people prefer the word strategic power over strategic autonomy because autonomy might lead to the conclusion uh, uh, that somebody would like to go it all by himself or herself. Uh, but anyway, apart, apart from the definition of strategic autonomy, uh, what I would like to add here is that uh, strategic autonomy uh, and the European Union, where, where are we after Brexit? Where are we after Brexit? What, what, what is Europe militarily uh, after Brexit? Uh, uh, that, that is, with a slight exaggeration, that is France. Uh, because Germany, uh, of course, is, 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 is extremely important, but Germany is not, for reasons we all understand, at the forefront uh, uh, when it concerns uh, hard military power. And I say again, I, I, I fully understand that. So what, what we need to do in Europe, uh, and th that is, I think, uh, a notion important for the European Union, but for NATO as well, by the way, is see how we can, after Brexit, get the United Kingdom as closely linked as possible to what's happening inside the European Union in the realm of defense. And, th and that's why, uh, with another hat on and in another capacity, I, I have, with a group of, of, of Dutch colleagues, proposed that we should have in uh, uh, Europe, in Brussels, a, a very informal institution, I underline very informal, the European Security Council, which builds on ideas uh, voiced by uh, Chancellor Merkel and, and, and uh, President Macron, uh, but an informal body uh, consisting of, of France, Germany and the UK, and then we add on the Secretary General of NATO and the Chairman of the European Council. So that in time of a crisis, there is a start for the division of labor. Who is going to act? Is it the European Union? Is it NATO? Is it a combination of the two? Is it a coalition of the willing? So that, that, that for me is an important element in, 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 in trying to fill out or fill in that notion of, of, of strategic autonomy. Uh, without harming NATO, of course, without harming NATO, uh, uh, and, and adding beef to what the European Union can bring to bear in crises where we as Europeans cannot always ring the, do the doorbell of the Oval Office. Think about the Sahelian zone in Africa. When there's a crisis erupting there, and some people say that, that that might be, let's hope not for heaven's sake, that might be Europe's Afghanistan. When there's a major crisis in the Sahel, and France is in Mali, and the UN are in Mali, uh, th then we cannot go to, to uh, the US president and say, Mr. President, could you, could you please help us out? So Europe needs strategic autonomy. All right, I'll, I'll accept the word, but, but most and, and foremost also, also strategic power. And then I come back to you, General, because more European strategic power, as you, as you just said a moment ago, is very much in the interest of NATO and very much in the interest of your responsibilities as a Supreme Allied Commander. Mr. Sector, I, I couldn't agree with you more with respect to the to, to the phrase strategic autonomy. I, I, I also prefer something more along the lines of strategic power. Uh, with respect to the discussion on the architecture above the NATO level, I'll, I'll, I'll let you delve in that area, but I, I will tell you that, that your proposal is, uh, is very sane and it, it makes sense in any efforts to attempt to take strategic or organizations and improve their alliance and transparency is, is obviously a, a, a step in, in the correct direction. One of the things that, that we're very concerned about are, are these issues of military requirements. And, and you mentioned recently the United Kingdom, and as you well know, just uh, three and a half days ago, the United Kingdom w was able to produce a, a very sound budget that, that was very, very serious with respect to defense spending. And we're all very, very excited about this and the items that the UK plans to devote their energies and monies to are very well aligned with the overall strategic alignment and transparency of what we need in Europe to better generate peace. As, as you're well aware, Secretary General, they're, they're focused on, on comprehensive defense and shared response. They, they take a very, very global view at what takes place with respect to nation states uh, who are nefarious as well as international terror groups. And, and this is a prime example of, of a nation who, who's established a military plan and supported it with a budget who is targeting requirements that, that ultimately tie into our strategic alignment to allow us to generate more peace. What, what I owe the architecture j just below the levels that you started with are what, what it is that, that we need uh, to be successful with respect to keeping the peace within Europe. 
and, and the, the areas that we focused on are those that improve our speed in every category and those that improve our posture in every category. And if we can find one way to move one pallet uh, at, at greater pace by at least one kilometer per second from the United Kingdom to Poland, that's a gain because it could be that very, very one second that is the difference between an individual receiving PPE for COVID protection or not. So speed applies in all domains and it applies in all regions. And it certainly applies whole of government, whole of nation. And as we continue to press forward together with this better strategic alignment and transparency, all the way down to the, to the young level within our militaries, uh, we, we can apply speed, and posture and be in a position to where we can help generate greater peace. And I, I certainly see that taking place. And in my short time here as, as SAC year for the last year and a half, I have had multiple dealings with the military committee of the EU and multiple discussions with the chairman of the military committee of the EU, Claudio Graziano, uh, about these very subjects. And each and every one of those transactions affords us the opportunity to learn more and more about what our capabilities are to ensure that we don't unnecessarily duplicate what we are doing in the military domain and find ways to be as effective as we can at the strategic level when dealing with speed and posture. I think, thank you, General. I, I, I think, I think uh, what, what, what you say is, is, is on the mark. Uh, we, we have to uh, adapt uh, to a new environment. We have to adapt, uh, we in Europe, but that also goes for NATO and the European Union, uh, to what I, I do consider, and I think I can be as audacious to, to expect that the US president will, will, will agree with me. Uh, I, I think, uh, how are we going to, uh, to fill in what is asked of us, uh, be it NATO, be it the, be it the European Union, uh, of, of balancing China? And then I'm not only talking about politics, and not only talking about trade, I mentioned freedom of navigation already, uh, but I would also add uh, the whole uh, relationship in the sphere of technology, uh, be it artificial intelligence, be it biotechnology, be it quantum computing, uh, where we have to, uh, to be able uh, to match uh, what is happening on the, on the other side of the world. Uh, do, do not forget, uh, and that's another element I would like to bring in from a political angle, uh, that President Xi Jinping uh, in, in, in China clearly stated, uh, and I almost literally quote him now, our system is superior. So there is all, also a value element uh, in, that, in that relationship, an ideological element, if you wish, as we had that with the Soviet Union during, uh, during the Cold War. There's a human rights dimension, uh, uh, which is, I think, for the European Union, a big challenge to define a China policy and to ask to answer the question coming from the United States of America, uh, President-elect Biden, I'm, I'm, I'm all in for partnerships, for restoring partnerships. I'm all in for alliances. But dear friends in Europe and in that broader definition of the West I was depicting a moment earlier, what is your uh, gravitas? What, 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 what is your participation in those partnerships on, on, on all those issues? Uh, and I think that that is a challenge uh, uh, for NATO on top, General, of the challenges you have in NATO, uh, what I would qualify as, as the traditional challenge of, of seeing that your enhanced forward presence uh, is, 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 is all right on the eastern flank of, of, of NATO and that the instability around the NATO area is getting the, uh, the attention it needs, uh, be it the Black Sea, uh, be it, uh, as you quite rightly mentioned, General, uh, the Western Balkans, where I hope very much with you that North Macedonia will have a chance uh, of, 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 uh, of becoming a, a member of NATO uh, within, within the foreseeable future. Uh, as you know, that is again uh, rather problematic in the European Union because there is a nation which, uh, which doesn't like uh, North, North Macedonia uh, very much. Anyway, lots of, of political military challenges uh, and, and, and also the interchange between those political challenges uh, military challenges, and I add again, uh, tech challenges, uh, because why are we so much struggling on 5G and Huawei? Uh, that is because we as Europeans have forgotten to, to uh, substantially invest over the past decade in systems so that we could match uh, Huawei uh, uh, 
Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll stop here, General, because for the moment, I think that is more than enough. Over to you. Sekjin, much, uh, much of what you address had to do with malign influence on behalf of China globally. And, and, and we see that in the form of violating our sovereign domains and territories. And, and, and certainly it, in the South China Sea, in the Spratleys, that, that has been an issue. And as we take a look at air, land, sea, space, cyber, and soft, uh, we, we, we certainly uh, have many examples that, that we can put on the table that specifically addressed malign influence on behalf of China. And as you will know, uh, Mr. Secretary, Secretary General Stoltenberg has been keen to point out NATO's strength and its willingness to, to take a, a, a Pacific focus, to, to make sure that we can do all within our capability to, to, to shore up our ability to achieve peace within Europe and obviously outside of those boundaries. And, and one of the things that we have to do is, is in con continue to increase our, our vigilance in those areas of activities of malign influence below the actual level of kinetic conflict. And, and we've been very keen to watch that. And when we see a, an actor inside of Europe that, that has a history of malign influence from an informational domain perspective, uh, we, we number one, have to have the appropriate indications and warnings to identify that is taking place. And number two, have the appropriate command and control to be able to communicate with one another to, to, diminish, to diminish that malign influence. And the Huawei 5G is a classic example of, of the goodness of, of the alliance over the course of the last eight months. As we're all very, very familiar with, we've seen a proliferation of Huawei in Europe and several nations. And certainly over the course of the last 90 to 120 days, We've seen Huawei go in different directions outside of Europe as a result of those nations uh, not willing to communicate or work with Huawei in the 5G sector. And we've seen an increase inside of Europe for NATO's appetites and the EU's appetites to jump on to a, to a 5G contractor. And, and that too will improve our, our speed and posture with respect to all of the attributes that I talked about before. So in short, uh, we, we do uh, want to ensure that we have the ability to have the indications and warnings that project outside of our European boundaries to see if we have malign influence that could ultimately impact what takes place inside of our European nations. And I'm proud to report for the last year, we've, we've certainly improved in that area. It's comprehensive defense and shared response with the nations, understanding what happens in air, land, sea, space, cyber, and soft, and making sure that if we detect or see violations of, of our sovereign domains, of our sovereign territory, we, we have the strength and the ability to respond, and we have, and that continues to improve, and, and that's great NATO solidarity. Thank you, thank you, General. I, th I think we are nearing the uh, the end of our uh, of our uh, very interesting conversation. Let, let me let me let me add a, a, a few words. Uh, NATO uh, is uh, has to be and will always be an, an alliance which, if necessary, uh, can can project hard power. So NATO is, I think, uh, up to what I would qualify as a, as a hard power environment uh, globally, uh, and, and certainly as far as the challenges are concerned. But what I would like to see, and I think that is really in the interest of NATO, is that the European Union, which was not built as a hard power union, but as a soft power union, for good reasons, by the way, and that's why I like strategic power more than strategic autonomy, that the European Union will develop and as far as I'm concerned, that can happen under, under, under French-German leadership, because those are the two nations, and, and, and you may like or dislike President Macron. He has ideas, uh, European Intervention Initiative and what have you. He has ideas about the future of Europe, that under, under that leadership of, of, of France and Germany, and including, as I said in this, in this European Security Council, including the UK, Europe, Europe at a certain stage, rather sooner than later, in my opinion, uh, should, should be... Uh, a union which is also able to project hard power when in its, in, in its own environment uh, the need might arise to project hard power. Uh, and then I'm not, of course, talking about Article 5 and Article 4 situations in NATO. That will always be exclusively NATO. But I mentioned the Sahelian zone uh, where I think there might at least be a discussion if, if and when necessary uh, who, would, uh, who would and who might act. 
General, I, I, I give you the, 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 the final the final word, but let me say that it was a great pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to have this uh, this conversation with you. O over to you, General. Thanks, Mr. Secretary. It, it's a thrill to get to see you again and be able to spend some time with you. I, I must tell you, as, as much as I think you and I dislike the, the phrase strategic autonomy, I think you and I really like the term hard power. And uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more with respect to your characterization of, of where NATO is and its ability to, to, to assist in that area. And I will also tell you, as, as you well know from, from all of your experience and all of your time as, as our Secretary General, in, in my hat as SAC year, in my hat as the UCOM commander from a U.S. military perspective and from a European military perspective, uh, the, the opportunities that I've had to work side by side with my French counterparts and my German counterparts, the relationship has never been stronger. The, the, the growth and capability of the mission sets inside of those militaries ha, has never tried any harder to improve. And, and I feel like our campaign momentum with respect to our ability to get better each and every day is, is dramatically improving over time. That's what you would expect out of those militaries. And my promise to you, Mr. Secretary, is it still exists today just as it did in your time. And it's, uh, it's just absolutely wonderful to see. One of the things I'd like to close with is our ability uh, to, to generate peace in, in all domains, in all regions from a comprehensive perspective in competition to crisis and conflict is, is growing with each and every passing second. And, and that's what we need to continue to do in those areas. Uh, the, the nations are focused on the concept for the deterrence and defense of the Euro-Atlantic area and they're finding ways to improve our indications and warnings to see the environment. They're finding ways to improve our command and control, and they're finding ways to improve our mission command, which is finding a way to get better from a readiness perspective with respect to resilience and respect to responsiveness, and the nations are doing a wonderful job. Mr. Secretary, it was, it was great to be with you. It was great to see Jamie, and I'm really excited about the future discussion topics that are coming up in cyber and space. And I think those are areas that we need to continue to cultivate to ensure that we can be more comprehensive in our ability to generate peace in Europe. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, great seeing you. Thank you, General. And we over back to Jamie, uh, my trusted anchor in my, in my NATO days and, and years. O over to you, Jamie. And thanks, General. Bye-bye. Always, Secretary General, always. Uh, uh, yep, no, thank you so much for leading that strategic conversation. Uh, General Walters, uh, SACOD, Supreme Allied Commander Europe, thank you so much for giving us your, your time. And thank you to both of you for the very open, frank, and uh, and far-reaching uh, discussion that you had there. We spent the first hour looking very much at uh, European uh, power applied to internal resilience issues and applied to the neighbourhood. But both of you usefully reminded us that there's a big world out there and it's not always a, a very uh, cooperative or very peaceful world. And if European power is going to mean anything, it's going to be also the ability to contribute to stability in the wider world. Uh, come if the hour, come if the institutions... Uh, you both sort of uh, pointed out this great paradox and it's at the moment when the challenges are at the greatest that we need uh, on both sides of the Atlantic uh, the institutions of government uh, to step up uh, in their willingness to work together and engage with each other but also challenge each other uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we're going to see that in the years ahead. So again uh, that was an excellent strategic conversation. It really was the, the best compliment that we could have had to the earlier discussion and thank you to to both of you for uh, your intellectual input there. Uh, that wraps it up then, ladies and gentlemen, as far as uh, this segment of uh, the Security Summit is concerned. Uh, but as uh, Yap pointed out uh, and Sako pointed out, we do have uh, tomorrow cyber. Uh, and uh, artificial intelligence. We do have space coming up on Wednesday. Uh, so uh, look forward to seeing you back here uh, very, very soon indeed. But in the meantime, again, thank you for joining us today uh, and uh, uh, have a pleasant evening. Stay safe and uh, please uh, be back here uh, tomorrow. Bye for now.